Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 157. And for this one, we get into some 510 action at Aria. You guys are gonna love it. There's some big pots, there's some bluffs. There are some other, uh, some other hands where we make the nuts, which is pretty fun. But uh, before we get started, I have one announcement to make. I'm heading out to Phoenix on April 26th from noon to 6 p.m. I'll be playing at Gila River Hotels and Casino Lone Butte. They just opened up a brand new poker room out there, so uh, I'm super excited about that. If you're in the Phoenix area, then come hang out, play some poker, have some drinks with me. I'll be probably in the five to 500 spread limit game, but I might play some other stuff. And um, at 6 p.m., I'll be going to a bar on property to have some drinks with anybody who wants to hang out. All right, let's go ahead and get started. We're on our way to grind 510 at Aria in Las Vegas. The poker room is one of the nicest in the country and has tons of action. If you get lucky, you may even see Andrew Nimi firing in the PLO streets like we do on this night. I buy in for 3,000, which is the max here. It's twice as much as the max at Bellagio, so this tends to be the next level up for poker pros on their career trajectories. I'll talk more about that at the end of this video. We take our seat. There are a couple pros and a couple of rec players. I'm a little nervous and excited. It's fun to be playing with a yellow bird. Early on, we're dealt ace-queen suited in the small blind. Cutoff opens at 30. He's a good European pro and will have a wide range from his position. I should have the best hand the majority of the time. I 3-bet to 120. Getting called and playing a 3-bet pot out of position isn't ideal. That's precisely what happens, though. The opponent calls. We're heads up. The flop comes king-9-5 with two hearts and one diamond. We have one overcard and some backdoor draws. This is a tough situation that I don't enjoy being in. I don't have much. Still, I could be ahead, and I can potentially get folds out of small and medium pocket pairs that haven't made sets. I down bet to 100. If I get called, I'll bet again if I pick up equity by hitting a diamond or a card that gives me a straight draw. The cutoff calls. I don't get the sense that he's strong. He seems to just not want to fold for that small of a sizing. The turn is the seven of diamonds. We pick up the flush draw. This allows me the opportunity to continue firing. I increase the pressure, and I bet 300. I might play kings, nines, aces, or ace king this way. Cut off folds. I'm glad our bet gets through so that we don't have to rely on actually making a hand in order to win. It's a nice way to start the session. Here we get two McJiggities hot off the grill. The cutoff may have a knee problem because he's been limping in all over the place, just like he does into the pot here. Small blind calls for five more. It's half the price that it normally is for him. This isn't a raw store, so no one's getting a discount today. I raised to 60. The cutoff is okay paying a premium. He calls. I've seen him limp with all kinds of trash in previous hands. He's a recreational player and appears to enjoy getting involved frequently. The small blind folds. We're heads up. The flop comes king queen five with two diamonds. There are two over cards. The goal is to get to showdown cheaply or fold if I face too much aggression. I check. Rather than checking back, the cutoff bets 20. Can't fold for that amount. I call. The turn is the queen of spades. I like seeing it because it reduces the amount of combos that I could be up against that are beating me. I check, this time the opponent checks back. I doubt he'd do that with trips, and I don't think that he'd have bet so small on the flop with a pair of kings. I probably have the best hand. The river is the four of spades. The backdoor flush gets there. I'm not too concerned about it. I bet 40 to get value out of smaller pocket pairs or a hand like ace five or seven five suited. The cutoff folds. It's not a large pot, but I included it because it gives a little context for the very next hand. We're dealt ace king offsuit in the small blind. It starts out similarly as the opponent from the last hand limps in from the hijack. The button calls 10 as well. I raise once more to 60. The hijack calls. The button calls. We're going three ways to the flop out of position. Brace yourself because we don't play this one particularly well. It comes queen nine deuce rainbow. Check folding or maybe check calling seem like reasonable options. Instead, I bet 100. My thinking is that they shouldn't connect well with either of the limp colors ranges. They should have small or medium cards a lot of the time that won't be strong very often on this type of a board. The hijack calls. The button folds. We're heads up. The turn is a king. We make top pair with a kicker as good as Lionel Messi. I check for pot control purposes in case I'm up against jack 10, a set of deuces, king queen somehow, king nine or queen nine. The opponent bets 200. I've drastically underrepped my hand on this street, and this particular player does a lot of weird things. I can't fold, I call. I'd love to see a blank. The river is a 10. There are four to the straight out there. I check. The hijack bets 330. Against a player who takes more of a standard approach to the game, this should be an auto fold. Even against an unorthodox guy like this, it should still be a fold. In my head, I've underrepped my hand. This dude does strange things, and is really only repping jack 10 the way he's played this. I'm not sure if he'd go for value with two pair. 
He should with some of them. I'm just not sure that this guy necessarily would. I've been good at playing disciplined poker lately. Not right now though. I call. The hijack immediately shows King Jack of Diamonds. We had him on the flop and turn, but he got us on the river and he got the monkey to pay him off light. That's one of the worst calls that I've ever seen, but it's not the absolute worst. That title goes to, well, also me, but in another vlog. In fact, I hold the top 10 spots on that list. We lose lots of extra dollars that we don't need to there. Sometimes I just get curious and I can't help myself. If you're still watching, I assume you're only here for entertainment purposes. I hope some very powerful beings are looking out for you if you're here trying to learn anything. We pick up King-10 offsuit on the button. This is the third hand in a row that we're getting involved in. The same opponent from the last two hands limps in from middle position. I have two words on my mind, revenge. I raise the 40, the small blind calls, the limper calls as well. Three of us see the flop. It's Jack-10-3 with two hearts. We've got middle pair and some backdoor draws. Checks to me. I don't feel comfortable betting for value and I don't need to turn my hand into a bluff. I check back. The turn is another Jack. Checks to me once more. It's unlikely that anyone has trips or better because they would have at least bet on the turn. I'll have the best hand a lot of the time. I bet 60. Maybe I can get value out of a worse 10 or a smaller pocket pair. The small blind ponders her decision. She makes the call. The middle position player folds. It's heads up. The river is the seven of spades. Nine eight makes the straight and pocket sevens make it both. The small blind checks. My sense is that I still have the best hand. I could be up against queen 10, nines, eights, and a few other weaker holdings that might call a bet. The trick is trying to get value out of hands that are worse than yours when you yourself aren't really that strong. There's a common thought in poker, I even perpetuate it sometimes, that if you can't get called by worse, then there's no point in betting. That's true, but it's usually an excuse for being lazy and not wanting to go through all the amounts you could potentially bet. For instance, let's say we're up against pocket nines in this hand, would pocket nines call a bet at 10 or 20? Almost certainly. Let's go up the ladder from there, would pocket nines call 50? After calling 60 on the turn, again, the answer is probably yes. With the range of hands that I put my opponent on, I settle on a bet of 100 for value. I have the added benefit of just losing the previous hand, so maybe it'll look like I'm on tilt and I can get called even lighter than normal. After quite a bit of thought, the small blind calls, I turn over the cards, they're good. We don't completely recover from the prior hand, but we get a solid chunk back at least. A few orbits later, we look down and see King Queen suited in the cutoff, onto the gun limps in, he needs to be punished to the full extent. I raise to 40. The small blind is a somewhat new player to the table. He three bets to 130. It's on the smaller side. Under the gun folds. I'm getting over two to one and I'm in position. I call, we're heads up. The flop comes ace, jack, deuce with two spades. We flop the nut flush draw and a gutter. Small blind checks. I'm not sure if he's trapping with a set or perhaps he has a hand like kings or queens and genuinely doesn't like the flop. I check to see a free card. It's the 10 of clubs. We drill the straight. What a dream. The small blind checks once more. Most people don't check twice with sets after being the aggressor pre-flop. Maybe he's not that strong. I bet 140 for value. The opponent isn't gonna be chased away for that amount. He calls, I'm rooting for a blank. That's what we get. The river is the three of clubs. We still have the nuts and we have something on the line. We just need to reel it in. The small blind checks. He's going to pain town and I wanna give him the full experience but I can't do it unless he pays full price. I bet 450. I'm hoping that the opponent will be towards the top of his range or maybe he'll call me light thinking that I could be bluffing with a hand like nine eight suited or a small pocket pair player thinks for a very long time. Haley's comment is come and gone twice before he ultimately makes the call. We get him good. No one at the table expected us to have it. The player called us with second pair. He shows that he has pocket kings. We make the maximum on that one. We go from being slightly stuck to being up 500 on the session. It's our turn for pocket kings. We're in the hijack. Under the gun limps in. The player on my right is a longtime viewer named AJ. He raises to 40. I three bet to 140. Under the gun folds, the initial preflop raiser calls for 100 more, we're heads up in position, the flop comes e 64 with two diamonds, the opponent checks, most of the time I'll check back, here I mix in a down bet at 120 to potentially get calls out of some worse hands like small pocket pairs. The player calls, the turn is another six, the opponent checks, I check back for pot control. The river is a third six, we make a boat the hard way, no check this time from our nemesis, he bets 200. It's not a large amount. There's a good chance he has an ace and is value betting. There's some possibility he has a hand even as good as queens and he's kind of naming his price or putting out a blocker bet. Making bad calls for smaller amounts when I'm getting good odds doesn't bother me too much. Making incorrect folds in these situations gives me nightmares though. I call so that I can sleep better later. 
The opponent shows that he has a7 offsuit. He made a speculative raise preflop, then didn't want to let it go after I three bet him. He outflopped me, and took me to value town on the river. He wins it. We're about even on the session. Now we have ace three suited under the gun plus one in a seven handed game. I raised to 30. The hijack is after some B radical dollars. He three bets to 90. In a smaller game, I'd probably fold, but we're playing more than 250 big blinds effective. I call to see if we can drill something. We're heads up. The flop is king six five rainbow. We don't have much except backdoor draws and one over. I check. The hijack down bets to 70. My fold button was mouthing off to me on the ride to the casino, so I made it walk home. It's not with me. I call. Let's get the four of hearts one time. Instead, we get the three of diamonds. I check. I'll fold to a reasonably sized bet. The hijack actually checks back. We get a free card and we make the most of it. The river is another three. We end up with trips in one of the most unexpected ways possible. When I have a strong hand that I shouldn't have, I like to bet on the larger side. I need to make enough money to cover the times that I call light in certain instances that I don't make hands. I toss out 300. It could look like I'm trying to steal it because the hijack check back turn and will rarely have better than top pair. I'm sure my line looks a little fishy, although I could play full houses, ace king or king queen this way. Over 45 seconds go by before the opponent eventually calls. I show the backdoor trips. What a run out. We've got the winner. I have a feeling that I might have gotten called extremely light, maybe even by something like ace queen. Another nice pot comes our way. Next, we log into our eBay account and purchase two rare queenie babies. We're in the cutoff. Under the gun plus one limps in. The player on my right raises to 40. He's the one that cracked my kings earlier in the three bet pot. It's time to get him back. I three bet to 140. Under the gun plus one calls for 130 more. I wasn't expecting that. The hijack also calls. Both opponents are viewers of the channel. We're going three ways to the flop. It's 10 7 6 with two spades. We have an overpair, but this smashes the ranges that we're up against, and it isn't typically going to be good for my range since I'll be capped at one pair. Checks to me. If I bet on this board, good players can check raise with a wide range of hands, then bomb turn and river, and I'll never be able to call down without significantly improving because they could have a straight, any of the set combos, or maybe even two pair that I won't have after I three bet. I don't even have a backdoor flush draw. I check back. The turn is the ace of spades. Now it's very unlikely that I'm ahead. It checks to me once more. I check, just wanting to get to showdown. The river is the five of spades. Four to the flusher out there. Under the gun plus one checks. The hijack bets 300. As much as I enjoy making bad river calls, I can't do it here. I fold. It's a good decision. Under the gun plus one fold as well. What do you have, AJ? You have anything good? Yeah. You had me? You have the nuts? On the turn? Oh, nice. We certainly weren't going to get King Jack of Spades to fold on the flop. The check back there ends up saving us some money. Towards the end of the session, we look down at 6 4 suited in the big blind. The cutoff raises to 30. Small blind calls. I call for 20 more. We're going three ways to the flop. It's ace 10 deuce with two hearts. We've got a small flush draw and a backdoor straight draw. Small blind checks. I check to the cutoff. He bets 40. Small blind calls. I haven't put in a check raise as a bluff in a while. I do it here. I bet 160. I can have a set of tens or deuces and some two pair combos. Cut off folds. Small blind folds. King queen offsuit face up. I'm glad to get some better hands out of there. We scoop one last pot and book a small win before heading out. I played for three hours. I won 175, and there were just a lot of big hands that were, you know, around thousand dollar pots. So uh, I ran good in some spots and not so good in other ones. Um, big hands in general, big starting hands weren't really holding up. I cracked that one guy's kings, and then my kings, my queens both lost, and I called light with the ace king on the river, and uh, pretty pretty happy to come out with a win. That's it for this one guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you made it this far, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons because it does help out the channel. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section and I'm happy to get back to you. Uh, let's see, if you're in the Phoenix area, then come hang out, have some drinks, play some poker with me at the Gila River Hotels and Casino, Lone Butte, brand new poker room. They just opened up April 19th. I'll be there April 26th from noon to 6 p.m. playing in the five to 500 spread limit game. I might dabble in some other stakes as well. And then uh, at 6 p.m. I'll be going to a bar on property to hang out and have drinks with anybody who just wants to talk about poker or anything else. 
I mentioned earlier in the video that I was gonna uh, discuss the normal kind of uh, trajectory for a person playing for a living in Las Vegas. If you're playing one, two or one, three, I typically don't advocate playing for a living just because it's really stressful to make enough money to cover your expenses and then um, save money on top of that. So I would recommend having a, a, another job and playing poker on the side. But there are some one, three games that you can make some money in, which would be the win one, three and the Orleans. Both of those are 500 caps. Uh, the, the Bellagio 2.5 is a similar game. It's a 500 max buy-in as well. So you're gonna start out kind of at those levels and then work your way into the 1K max buy-ins that are gonna be at Aria, Venetian, Red Rock. And then from there, you'll go to the Bellagio 510 or the Win 25. Both of those are 1500 max buy-ins. Then you'll move up to Aria 510, which is a 3K max buy-in that you saw in this episode. And uh, from there, you'll go to either 1020 at Bellagio and Aria or to the 510 at the win, which is, which is uncapped. All those games are uncapped and play really big. Um, you know, those are the biggest games that run regularly in Las Vegas, although now Bellagio has been getting uh, 2040 No Limit and some other, some other really big games um, a few times a week as well. So I'm not sure how many of you will think that's interesting, but I uh, thought I would share it with you. Um, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables, and I'll see you next time.